Let me just make sure that I didn't go. Okay. Uh, and then, um, how can I move this down? There we go. Uh, so yeah, so in these patients, so you suspect um, acromegaly in these patients, so then you, you, know, you look at the lab, you measure the IGF-1 concentration. We talked about kind of why IGF-1 is more important than both of them, but typically both of them are checked. Um, if it's normal, <clears throat> then acromegaly is unlikely, then you know, the endocrinologist will come up for other things. In these patients, we don't see them. They don't send them our way. This is why it's crucial to have endocrinology they can save you some of the headache of this workup. Um, and then if it's mildly elevated, then they start doing some glucose tolerance test um, to see if it's suppressed um, versus if it's not, then you know, they end up getting a pituitary MRI. So this is kind of where we cap we capture them as neurosurgeons, um, typically in here. Sometimes they send the, sometimes we capture them in here, meaning the endocrinologist diagnose acromegaly and then they order the pituitary MRI and they give us a heads up um, versus sometimes they wait for the result of the MRI, and then once they've confirmed that it's not present, then they send them all away. Um, and then at that point, it's a matter of are they a surgical candidate in terms of all their other medical comorbidities? Are they safe for surgery? Is the tumor easily accessible and things of that sort? Um, and if it is, then definitely um, surgery. Um, if the surgery doesn't provide them remission, then they end up needing second line treatment, which is typically medical treatment. The medical therapy for acromegaly has, has improved pretty dramatically. Um, to where for the most part for these patients, they can actually cure them with medical uh, treatment after surgery. And then radiation therapy we talked about as a third line. Um, uh, there we go. I know I, I'm trying to keep track of the time because uh, I do have a couple of our videos embedded in here. I want to leave time for questions, but if I'm going too fast, please just let me, please just let me know. Absolutely. This is a great pace so far. Um, this is not advancing again. What did I do? Uh, could you try clicking the bottom left of the screen with the right arrow? Oh, I see. I think I clicked some drawing. Thing. Oh, there okay. we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and then this is uh, basically showing um, consensus statement for cushions. So we just looked at for acromegaly and then looking at for cushions um, disease. Again, by the time we get here to this old question of cushions, it is a topic, um, ACT secreting tumors have been rolled out, right? That ends the name cushions disease because um, they've been confirmed to, to have of um, something that points to the pituitary gland. Um, and then again, in these patients, pituitary surgery is the first line unless they're, you know, the patient is unstable. Sometimes like we had a patient who came in by the time her Cushing's disease was diagnosed, she was pretty bad, um, like fractures everywhere, pretty frail. Um, and even at that, we try to, you know, medically clear her for surgery and things of, things of that sort. And, and she just didn't do well. Um, so sometimes in those patients, you skip some step and they end up getting going straight to BLA uh, because they're just not suitable surgical candidates. Um, but if they are, you do pituitary surgery, um, I do scenario surgery provides them remission and then they get checked for, um, or they have to be followed for, for recurrence. Um, the remission rate, if, uh, if there's clear evidence of tumor on MRI, depending on where you look, um, it's somewhere in the 60 to 80% range um, in, in a high volume center, right? High volume experience center um, versus, um, uh, so then, and then in terms of recurrence, and again, it's not 100%, so you, you have to monitor, it's not 100% remission rate, but even those who undergo remedy, they can always recur um, down the road as well. And the five-year recurrence rate is somewhere in the 30% range. Um, um, and then in terms of labs that they checked, both in terms of originally diagnosing it, typically you need at least two labs. So late night, uh, salivary cortisol, 24 hour urinary cortisol, um, and then they do desk dexamethasone suppression tests. So typically before we get them, before the, all these labs have been done, again, stemming on the importance of having good uh, endocrinologist um, that can do this. And then when you die, when the recurrence is diagnosed, then you go back into looking at the MRI, is there clear actionable tumor on that MRI? Meaning you can say, yes, there's tumor on the left side over here that if I were to take it out, that increases their chance of achieving remission a second time. Versus if there isn't, 
you can still take them in if everything points to re recurrent Christian's disease, but with the caveat that um, you, know, you may get in there and not find anything. And sometimes um, if your inferior petrosal sinus sampling is, is helpful um, in some of these cases, um, and sometimes some patients would just say, you know what, I just want surgery regardless. I want you to go in and take a look. But doing surgery a second time increases the risk of hypopituitarism, panhypopituitarism in, in those patients. Um, so then persistent disease, reparation, again, if there's a good surgical target. If there isn't, medical therapy is also discussed with the patient. Um, even if there is, you still discuss that with them. Um, and then, you know, weighing the risk versus benefit of surgery and radiation is also discussed. But for the most part, radiation is reserved as a third line uh, treatment, meaning you either do the second surgery or medical therapy, if that fails, they go to radiation. Um, medical therapy, same thing. If, say, they don't want surgery, second treatment, they decide medical therapy, it doesn't provide control. You can always consider surgery as a third line. And then really BLA is down here. Um, which from a, basically what the BLA does is you're treating the way downstream effect, right? The effect of, of uh, um, you know, at the adrenal glands is what you're treating with the BLA um, is the bottom line. But sometimes without the negative feedback loop, some of these, so say they have a pituitary adenoma, they didn't get surgery, they do BLA, without that negative feedback loop, that tumor can increase. So you still have to keep an eye on the tumor. So they're at risk for your vision loss if the tumor increases, apoplexy and things like that. <clears throat> hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.